Hey guys, thanks for joining. We're gonna play with props today, and I have had a lot of fractures lately, so we're gonna talk about fractures. Very simply, but fractures. So on my first little example here, um, I have a tibia. Uh, these are very common fractures. We see them in all kinds of breeds, but tibia fractures, probably one of the most common fractures that we see out there. There's a lot of different types of fractures. So this particular fracture, we have a tibia. We have different parts of all bones. We call them the proximal part. We call it the shaft. Then we have the distal. And then depending on how the actual break is, transverse, short oblique, long oblique, comminuted, multiple fractures, multiple sites, uh, aligned, misaligned, a lot of variables. So this is just a short little splurge. This particular one is what's called a short oblique, and we have that little fracture right down there. Um, depending on the fracture, every doctor is different, depending on the age, if it's displaced or not displaced, sometimes we can get away with splinting and casting. Sometimes we need to use pins and wires. Um, plating is another thing. A lot of different versions, depends on where the fracture is, how bad and a lot of patient factors. So this particular one was one from a continuing education seminar where they let us keep little samples. So what that is, is we paid to go get trained on orthopedics or something like that. And these are some of the little practice things that they give. Sometimes you get to do them on just these. A lot of them you start with this and then you go to an actual cadaver patient and get to do it on a cadaver patient with the actual muscles, tendons, vessels, nerves, all that good stuff. But when it looks like this, it's really easy to plate, so that's cool. But not realistic in the real life patient. <laughs> so this particular one, um, they had put a put an X fix on, if I recall. So they put a couple pins through here, and then they had a bar on the outside, and that is called an external fixator. Basically, it just means some of your hardware and materials that you use to repair is outside the skin, outside the patient. Hence. X fix and that's one way that somebody did this one uh, this was just another example of another oblique fracture this one's a little bit longer uh, couldn't find the other piece in the bucket but there is another half to the bone and what they did with that one is they put a what's called a plate rod so they put a pin through and they made a hole inside that bone and then on this side they put a plate so they did the measurements, exposed everything, and went through, and then they did what's called compression, depending on the type of plate they used, DCPs versus locking, a lot of different versions. And that's one way. Uh, this one is another very common fracture. We've actually done a couple of these uh, over this last week. This is a radial ulnar fracture and very common in toy breed dogs, so small dogs. A lot of times they jump down from something and they snap their arm. Uh, this part would be the elbow. This is where the elbow joint would be. It would hinge. Hopefully you can see that a little bit. They break in all kinds of different areas. Sometimes they break low on this radius. Sometimes they break high, sometimes in the middle, sometimes in two places. Uh, toy breeds tend to break at the very bottom a little bit and a lot of times we'll put what's called a T-plate down there, and a lot of them do fairly well, but the smaller the patient, they do tend to have more complications and issues for blood flow and different issues that are associated. Now, this particular one, they made a mid-shaft fracture through the radius and the ulna, and as their repair, they, they had us do a plate on this one. You can see the little screw holes and kind of plate that thing together. Um, depending on the size of the dog, sometimes we'll actually fix this ulna, sometimes we don't. Depends if we have a pin that fits, sometimes it's not worth the anesthetic time. Uh, one that I did recently, it was a little bit bigger patient, so I was able to get the pin in there. And it just makes you feel better to have a little more extra support, it protects the plate a little bit more, and gives you a little bit more plate life. Um, you know, there are some newer traditions where some doctors, once again, very variable depending on the patient and location. After the bone is healed, we will do what's called a stage removal and go in and remove 
some of the screws, sometimes all the screws, sometimes everything. Sometimes people will just leave them and if they cause a problem down the road, deal with the problem then. The stage removal is designed to kind of prevent those down the road problems from bone reabsorption and things like that. Once again, a lot of variables depending on the size of the patient, duration before repair, and all, all those factors. Um, this one is a little different, as you can tell. These are real fractures, these happen. Uh, I usually see these more frequently with traumatic issues, usually hit by cars or variations of that. A lot of the other ones are they jumped, they fell, they twisted, things like that, less traumatic than I got run over by a car and my femur shattered. This is what's called a comminuted fracture. It means we have lots of little pieces and we cannot reduce it very well. That's okay, we have ways around that. Um, but typically plating is one of the more common ways to deal with that. This type of fracture doesn't usually do great with splints and casts but sometimes that's all the client can afford, so we do the best we can with what the client can afford. But these, much, much better. I tend to do plate rod combos, so I would put a pin through here, have it go through, stretch that actually back out to the correct length. We don't really care how much those bones line up. Um, over the last decade or so, we've learned that's less important and we don't have to have everything lined up perfect. Mother Nature does a pretty good job of taking care of that and will actually suck that in. And it is very well documented now, so we don't actually have to line all those up perfectly. We just gotta get them in the general area. If it's alive and has blood flow and we stabilize it, Mother Nature does a lot of good things and prayer doesn't hurt, so you can throw that in there. <laughs> um, this particular one, um, we did the rod combo. You can see the little hole right in there that they had us make. We run it down through both segments. The little pieces of bone will kind of stick to a little bit. I tend to put grafts. Some doctors will put putty. Some do nothing. Something called Meepo, which is a little different. Uh, a lot of ways to go about it. And then we put a plate on there as well that spanned the whole thing. Um, older school terminology is called bridging. So a lot of times you would bridge this type of fracture with your plate. There's a lot of different ways to apply a plate to have them do different things, depending on your circumstance, whether it's this versus this fracture versus this fracture. And then we have another one, which is this fracture. So this is a femur. <laughs> this is a femur. These are the same examples. Very, very different looking. Um, on this one, patient just broke off right up here where a lot of the tendons, insertions, and origins are, so where the muscles attach. And when you flex, when you flex or contract those muscles, that's when you get flexion or extension. Um, sometimes they break where a lot of those muscles attach. Think about your quadriceps. A lot of muscles, they all attach in a certain area. This particular patient, which we've done a few of these fractures in the last month, break right there. A lot of times they go up actually. And what we do is called, it's called a tension, tension band technique, typically. And usually we drill a couple holes right in there. We run some pins and then we use a wire, typically in a figure eight fashion. And we basically counter those forces that are trying to elevate that and keep it down and in place. And we compress that bone. And when you get really good bone on bone contact, they tend to heal a little bit faster and less complications. Sometimes that's feasible. Sometimes that's less feasible, but that's okay. So hopefully that gives you guys a little insight on some of the different fractures, a lot of variability, a lot of different things, and a lot of different ways to even fix the same fracture and it can vary on client compliance, patient and patient compliance, and then the doctor's comfort and experience and different things associated with those fractures. Sometimes the surgery is gorgeous and beautiful and the client is doing everything right, but I got a difficult 
JA <laughs> patient and they just make it very difficult for the client to do what we're asking them to do. And that's real, that's real life. Um, we, I understand that, most veterinarians understand that and we do the best we can. That's where a lot of sedation drugs come into play and are really nice. Um, but usually with orthopedics, I tell clients there's three phases, how the actual surgery goes, and, um, and then owner compliance, keeping them confined, keeping that e-collar on, making sure they don't chew the splint off, not running, leash walks, those things, and then patient. And sometimes we gotta sedate those guys. Sometimes they're great and they do it all on their own. So hopefully that was helpful for you guys and something a little interesting and a little different than what you usually get. So hope you learned and we'll see you guys later. Ta-ta. <laughs>